this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about a boogie woogie and I'm going to play one. I'm Steve Vincent. I'm Paul Schultz. And this is the Don't Panic Radio Show. Sit back, relax, and ignore the news. Nothing you're about to hear is true. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. The plan, the plan. All right, well, welcome to the show. Paul and I are happy to, to be here. Last week's show apparently was very popular. It was it was a tweener show, just meant to be the normal high quality, but not a super special show, but right. people seem to right. like it. Yeah. They like, I think they enjoy my plight they like a those, little bit too much. They like those headlines, for one thing, but even more importantly, mm. they like it when you tell a story, you know, that has a beginning and a, and a middle and an end. It didn't. Mine didn't have an end. It just stopped. <laughs> my my story is still going. <laughs> I go next week for my ear exam. So can't wait. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. By the time this airs, mm-hmm. uh, Thanksgiving will have happened. And one very special thing is happening this year. I, hmm. I'm actually going to attempt green bean casserole. What What do the kids say? Picks or it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking uh, maybe maybe I'd take a video of parts of it. You know, it could be like one of those yeah. stupid recipe videos you see all the time where they're they're mixing the stuff up and then it goes fast yes. and slow you, and you perfectly manicured fingernails. No, nobody ever has any split nails or anything when they make those things. So if I go get a manicure uh, from the local manicurist, uh, what do you call a manicurist shop? Manicure manicure city. Then um, manicurosity, mani- Wait, that's <laughs> manicotti. Then I'll uh, I'll put it on the Don't Panic Radio Show expense account. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the video and I'll put the <laughs> <laughs> music behind yeah. it. <laughs> hey, uh, speaking of um, making up words for stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my god. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last night, my wife and I were watching this show called Dogs. And <laughs> what's it about? Yeah, right. And I was trying to figure that out as we're watching it. Is it about like Snoop Dogg? I was and- making fun of it the whole time because okay. um, they didn't do any emotional buildup. This girl apparently it's about. Apparently, it's a series. I thought it was just mm. one documentary, and so I was complaining <laughs> that they jumped into the story too fast without any emotional buildup. This girl. <laughs> how about how about a kiss, boy? <laughs> tried nibbling on her ear first. So this girl has epilepsy, and mm-hmm. you know she could just start having a seizure at a moment's notice, and nobody will know, and she could die. Right. So mm. they get this dog who's trained to recognize when she's having a seizure, and the dog barks and alerts someone nearby to come help her. Right. Well, I thought. It would have been nice to have a lot of build up to that, like have her almost die a few times before they <laughs> discover the ability to get this dog. But they just jump right into the oh, we're here to get our dog today. But mm-hmm. so while I'm making fun of it, <laughs> I realized <laughs> somebody says that they were hoping they would get a specific breed of dog called a golden doodle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, What? Is a golden, what's a golden doodle? And my wife is like, well, you know, it's a, it's a golden retriever in a, in a poodle. I said, there's no D in any of those words. I mean, where, how's it a doodle? Is it, so you can't do that. You can't just go labradoodle, golden doodle. It's got to be like a golden redoodle or golden reboodle. Golden redoodle. Golden, golden reroodle. Go to read. <laughs> a, a failed spec script for a James Bond movie. <laughs> and then I said, what, what if you had a Yorkie with a poodle? Is that a Yorkie doodle? <laughs> Yorkie doodle. <laughs> He'd be a dandy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we call him dandy. He's a Yorkie doodle. That's right. <laughs> or a free zombie doodle, a free zombie doodle. <laughs> <Free zombies. laughs> Didn't we go to school with her? 
<laughs> and I was thinking like a like a Yorkie combined with a poodle uh, combined with a um, <laughs> like a, a Labrador would be like a <laughs> Yorkie doodle. <laughs> this is about how I went last night too. We're both trying to come up with dog names, but we can't stop laughing. <laughs> Yorkie doodle a. It's a Yorkie doodle a. <laughs> this is my Yorkie doodle a. Or you could you could combine a, a husky and a poodle and have a eighties punk rock band called Husky Doodle. Husker Doodle. <laughs> Husker Doodle. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Fronted by Joe Dirt. It's a Husker Doodle. <laughs> That's right. Husker Donal. Husker, Husker Doodle. Doodle. And uh, German Shepherd, you know, Toby, German Doodle. Toby Wong. Toby Chu. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that's a bunch of nonsense. What we have in store for you this week <laughs> is a special edition of Softcore History. There's two reasons it's special. One is uh, it's not part of the Civil War series that I'm just starting I mean, we just made it through the first battle of Manassas. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt that series to bring you a uh, World War One themed uh, softcore history, inspired by uh, something that our good friend Paul Volstorff, Paulie V, posted uh, on Facebook right around Armistice Day, a Remembrance Day, or Veterans Day, or whatever you want to call it. Hmm. We call it we call it Veterans Day here. It's it's uh, November eleventh, which I will never forget again. Uh, <laughs> we call it Veterans Day here. Um, in the United States, they call it Remembrance Day in Europe and in and in uh, Great Britain. Mm-hmm. In particular, and they also call it Armistice Day because it's the anniversary, and this year was the hundredth anniversary of the armistice between the uh, central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and uh, Italy, and then the allies, uh, Great Britain, United States, Canada, Russia. Right. Although Russia had dropped out by this point, so it wasn't really, they didn't really get in on the deal. They had already made peace with the Germans. (laughs) As much as anyone can make peace with the Germans. That's right. Never, never turn your back on the Germans. So, um, so we got into this conversation about the end of World War One or the end of the major hostilities on the Western Front and how the armistice, they chose a time and day. They said, okay, on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock a.m., we'll just stop fighting. And... Well, there was still fighting going on. People were still in the middle of battles. It's just nuts. They didn't even know. Some of them didn't. I mean, your, your, your average guy in the trenches, <laughs> there's no way he knew or he would have just quit. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out because I'm going to read you the story uh, that I'm calling the end of the war to end all wars. The following is based on actual events. At 2 minutes to 11, a machine gun opened and fired off a whole belt without a pause. A German machine gunner was then seen to stand up beside his weapon, take off his helmet, bow, and, turning about, walk slowly to the rear. John Buchan, British historian. Private George Pierce woke up on Monday morning exhausted. The Canadian from a small town in Nova Scotia hadn't slept much in days. His war had changed completely. The hundred days push took him and his battalion out of the trenches and deep into the Belgian countryside, all the way to Havre, a town on the outskirts of Mons 
which had just days earlier been liberated from the Germans. A few months ago, the German spring offensive had put the Allies back on their heels and had pushed them miles back. Like waves against a breakwater, Ludendorff's big gamble crashed against the French, British, the newly arriving Americans, and against George Price and his Canadian comrades. Now, it was time for the Allies to strike. They went over the top and fought non-stop to liberate the countryside of Belgium and every village they crossed. Winning felt better than losing, but George was in constant pain. His lungs still hurt from last year's gas attack that had put him in the hospital for a month. He was tired, hungry, and he just wanted to go home. But first, the war. He choked down a tin of coffee and some hard tack, and he scribbled a letter to his kid's sister. Just a line to let you know I still think of you. I hope I don't have to shoot anyone today. I will see you someday soon. Love, your brother. He folded the letter, and he put it in his breast pocket to mail later. He pressed it next to the fabric flower that his fiancée had knitted and sent to him last spring. At 0900, George and four fellow soldiers left the temporary post and headed out on patrol. Their objective was across a small canal. They would enter the small village of Havre and sweep for remaining Germans. At the same moment that the small patrol was leaving the relative safety of their outpost, a messenger ran into the command HQ with a simple but unbelievable message. An armistice had been signed and agreed, and hostilities would cease at 1100 that same day. General Cook sent runners immediately to inform the units of the Canadian 28th Battalion. Most had heard by 0930, and commanders were telling their men to find a hole and lay low until peace came. George's patrol left the last forward post just before a runner arrived with that news. The five men crossed a small bridge over the canal and started checking each house in the village. The only resistance they met were unarmed, exhausted Germans anxious to surrender. One or two put up a fight, but were quickly shot or captured and disarmed. Back across on the other side of the canal, another patrol had been organized to find George and his group to tell him that the war was ending. As this second Canadian patrol approached the bridge, a German machine gunner opened fire, and they were pinned down. Nearby, artillery raged, and more machine gun nests came to life. It was as though the Germans had received word of the impending peace and didn't want to have any leftover ammo at the end of the war. The Germans were fighting and dying until the last moments, desperately defending every square foot of a broken empire. On George's side of the canal, he and his companions prepared to exit the last house near the town square. The street outside erupted with machine gun fire, and they retreated back into the relative safety of the house, and they hunkered down. After what seemed like forever, the machine gun fire just suddenly stopped. George was the first to stand up. He walked to the front door and opened it and stepped out into the street. He could still hear artillery fire a few hills over a sound impossible to grow used to. And he flinched at every explosion. And he looked around, but he, he couldn't locate the nest from which a minute earlier steel rain was being hurled down. He gazed across the canal and saw his Canadian comrades. Their banner was waving, and they were flailing their arms and yelling something he couldn't hear over the pounding shells. As he stood there watching, the noise of the big guns faded. Then the noise of the smaller field guns tapered off, until finally, silence. And almost immediately, a new noise. He couldn't place this new, softer, sing-songy noise, almost like whistling. He searched his memory from months and years ago until he, he finally found it, and he placed it. It was birds. Had they been there the whole time, just going about their business while men destroyed each other? Or had they been patiently waiting until the violence stopped? 
Either way, they were building and rebuilding their nests. George could hear another sound now. The Canadian patrol was rushing across the footbridge and yelling, Over! And, and George was just thinking, Over what? As he thought this, and as he wondered at the industrious birds chirping away, he reached in his breast pocket and he felt the fabric flower his fiancée had made. He felt the folded paper of the letter he wrote that morning to his kid sister. He turned to his comrades in the house, and for the first time, he thought, could the war be over? And if it is, then why, why are we still fighting? What's the point? A half second before he had this thought, a sniper fired his last bullet of the war. The German had been hiding in the town hall cupola for days. Like George, he hadn't heard the war was over. The sniper's bullet found its target into George's back, nicking his heart out his chest, grazing the letter, and splattering blood on the fabric flower and through George's hand. He fell to the street, and as he looked up from the street, he was looking into the eyes of a beautiful young French woman suddenly, and he heard her say, The war is over. The war is over, and she was crying and and said, What did you come across here for? George could barely speak, but he somehow got the words out. I was just doing my job. So on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 at 10.58 a.m., Private George Lawrence Price of the 28th Northwest Battalion of the Canadian Infantry became the last documented Allied death prior to the armistice that took place at the 11th hour. He was buried in the St. Symphorien Military Cemetery just a few feet from another soldier who, up until the last minutes of the war, was just doing his job as a German sniper. Happy Veterans Day. (laughs) I discovered the story of George Price when I was researching what to do for Armistice Day. I uh, hadn't planned on doing an Armistice Day softcore history, Mm -hmm. but when Polly V posted that audio of the end of the war, (laughs) which may or may not be real, I did some reading, it, it... it um if it's not real it certainly is believable that that may have been what it would have sounded like you know yeah it's quasi authentic yeah <laughs> and so i was researching cuz i had remembered that quote that from the from the beginning about the machine gunner uh just standing up giving a theatrical bow and then slowly walking to the rear mm-hmm. i remember that quote from an, an episode of hardcore history and so I was kind of looking for that, and I wanted to see who said it and, and all that stuff. When I ran across the last casualty of the war, and I read his story, this George Price guy, and I was just... The the, the article that I read makes a point to say, well, his death is no more more or less tragic than the 20 million other deaths, right? Like, if you yes. think about this war and the pointlessness of the war, um, yeah. what his death does better than anything else I've read is really illustrates the futility and the pointlessness of the entire thing. Yep. First of all, the war was over, right? The idiots back at the, at the uh, negotiating table with their, you know, sitting in their relative comfort, um, big high back leather chairs. Yeah. Their cigars. Just, just like brandy, just like from wonder woman. They're, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly from Wonder Woman. The, they knew the war was over. They knew they had known for months that the war mm-hmm. was over. This this final push called the Spring Offensive by the Germans was pretty much their last attempt at trying to win this thing, and they just ran out of steam. Mm-hmm. You know, they just ran out. Yeah, of of the ability to fight, and when they were pushed back by the Allies, and then the Americans start showing up in numbers that that make a difference. It was clear <laughs> this thing was going to be over, right? Yeah. But the guys in their high back chairs with their brandy, instead of just going, okay, let's just call a ceasefire and figure this thing out, they were, mm-hmm. no, you keep fighting until they. There were people, uh, one famous uh, author, I'll call him, 
I'll tell you who he is later. I don't want to distort people's view of this, uh, <laughs> of this actual account. <laughs> but um, the one famous author who was an artillery <laughs> officer. Somehow I think I know where this is going. <laughs> he, he, was, uh, he said that um, German high command like wanted them to fight to the last person. And just mm -hmm. they didn't care if everybody died because they thought, hey, man, this is, uh, you know, this is for my pride and my honor. And in his view, the war had been lost on the home front, not by the Germans fighting in the front lines, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that combined with several mutinies that happened in the Navy because the Navy wanted to, they said, we're going to have to give up our ships. We don't want them to have our ships. So we can either scuttle them in the harbor or we could just go out in a blaze of glory and just sail out there and have one final pitched battle with the British Navy, and they would have been demolished, right? And thousands mm -hmm. more, uh, tens of thousands of sailors would have died. They all mutinied. They said, no, mm -hmm. screw you. And they went across the countryside starting to gather support for a, a general German rebellion. That's part of what drove the Germans to come to the table for peace, you know? Um mm -hmm. And and they and they were for the most part socialists uh, that were doing this. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, so as I was researching the one thing, I find this George Price thing. The, we could do a whole episode on how pointless World War One was, and yeah, I may have said this before. I know I've said it in conversations with various people. We we are still dealing with the consequences of. World War One today, all mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. stuff that goes on in the Middle East, the Cold War, the renewed Cold War, China, Vietnam, all of that can be traced back to if it hadn't been for World War One, none of that probably would have happened. Right. Well, you, we still use the same map and risk. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that that got World War One caused. You know, that's well, that true. If you look at a map of Europe. Just just start with Europe. If you look at a map of mm -hmm. Europe, mm -hmm. since I'm an American, I only think about America and Europe. You could probably That's say right. this about Asia and Africa as well, but it, Europe, um, if you look at a map of Europe from, say, 30 years prior to World War One, it looks nothing like the map of 30 years after World War One, right? Right. All these new countries, Poland's back. Poland hadn't been around in forever. And... It still pretty much looks the same today, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at a map of the Middle East from before World War One and then after World War One and then after World War Two, it looks nothing now. It looked nothing like it did before World War One, and all the people that lived there were like, "We don't know where you came up with these countries, right? These aren't countries. <laughs> you just made those up, right?" <laughs> and now we look at it and go. How come the Iraqis aren't fighting for their country? It's like, it's not really their country. It's not like they have right. a bunch of founding fathers who sat around and said, let's, <laughs> let's start a country, you know, and, uh, they don't have that common thing. They have religion that, that holds them together and culture. And after World War One, the allies just kind of split up the Middle East to their own liking, mm -hmm. you know, made their own countries. Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting off the topic. While I was researching, I keep trying to say this. While I was researching, I ran across George Price, and I love that story, but I couldn't find a good account of exactly what his last day was like. So I kind of made mm -hmm. some things up. But in general, that is how it happened. They went across to this yeah. village. He got he was shot by a sniper. I don't know if there was another Canadian patrol that came to find him. You know, I, I like well, to think there might have been. <laughs> you, you're probably about 90% accurate. I, mm -hmm. I just imagine that there was a lot more apologizing on the part of the Canadians. As <laughs> 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 you know, Pat, Patton Oswald has that joke about, you know you're getting old when you develop this un... You, you don't know why, but you just naturally develop uh, uh, an interest in World War II. When, <laughs> yeah. But for me, it's World War I because I've always been a World War II fan. <laughs> yeah. You know? Everybody loves World War the, II. <laughs> right. Most of all, people who <laughs> World War I, it. You, the more the more you learn about it, the more you're just like, imagine... Okay, 
just just think about because we talked about this a long time ago, but I'm just I'm just imagining this in my head. It's a world not unlike, you know, say like during like the the, the Napoleonic era. Yeah. All right. It's pretty. There, dudes got horses and shiny helmets big and feathers, sabers big and horse hair. Feathers. The, they look like a marching and band. What? And, <laughs> and wild mustaches. Yeah. <laughs> just the most. You know. The most. And then. They look like a. They look like a bunch of porn stars decided to start a marching band. <laughs> bunch of porn stars. This. <laughs> and then suddenly World War One. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, we had, we had like ironclads and what, sort of ironclads and whatnot during like the American Civil War, but not any kind of military machine, right? Like what sprang up out of World War One. So it yeah. was just a huge step, bonk, into you know this modern age or whatever. And Me- never before were there machine guns, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. artillery like that. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. You know, not that long ago we were, you know, this, and then suddenly, blam, there it is. Yeah. It's, to me, it's just fascinating. It really is. And, that, you know, we a lot has changed in our lifetimes, right? Your, yours and mine, you know, with technology and, and whatnot. Um, yes. I tell my kids lot, that every day. <laughs> and the world has changed quite a bit since 9-11 because of the reaction mm-hmm. of, the, of, the, um, of the West. But mm-hmm. when I think about what changed between 1914 and 1918, I don't <laughs> think I don't think anything has ever changed that fast. And I'd love to have that debate with somebody. Tell me an era where the entire fabric of how the at least probably the whole world, but certainly the West, how you know Europe and in mm-hmm. um, and, and so forth, how all that works. Because, like you said. If you if you had a photograph of Napoleon's cavalry, right, mm-hmm. and compared it to a photograph of the cavalry that marched into war, the French cavalry of, mm-hmm. of 1918, and this is almost 100 years apart, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. No. <laughs> and these no. guys are riding their riding these horses into machine gun fire. <laughs> and, and totally pointless. Like like if you look at World War 2, yes. people go, "Yeah, World War 2 was inevitable. It was going to happen, you know, because of Yeah. The peace terms and the just the way Germany was kind of their economy was screwed, and so of course some somebody like Hitler is going to come to power, and they may they may not be xenophobic Jew killers, but they're certainly going to try to rebuild the military. World War Two is probably going to happen, right? Then you go, yeah, but not if World War One didn't happen, it wasn't bound to happen, and World War One was not inevitable. <laughs> it's like some dude. In some backwater country, in some backwater city called Sarajevo, gets assassinated, and boom, everybody attacks everybody. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like they were just waiting for it to happen. So who, uh, who, who was that famous author that you were talking about earlier? <laughs> well, um, he wrote a book while he was in prison. Um, you may have heard of it. It's called Mein Kampf. <laughs> All right. Well, that that my friend is another episode of uh, Softcore History. <laughs> a treat for our listeners. I hope they liked it. So, what do, what do we got coming up next? I believe uh, we lost somebody very important to the world. <laughs> Not according recently. to Bill Maher, but oh, really? I, who cares what Bill Maher thinks? <laughs> yeah, people are losing their shit, and I'm just like, don't panic. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's just trolling. <laughs> right. Well, no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Don't feed the trolls, man. That's my new mm-hmm. hashtag. Whenever I see a comment that is clearly a troll, I just say, and people just like lose their shit. I just go, dude, mm-hmm. don't feed the trolls. <laughs> so I have no idea what he said. All I care about is what you have to say. And I think we're going to hear <laughs> from you on our next episodes. Yeah. And now that it's out there, you, you kind of have to do it. Well, you know what? It's the 21st day of the 11th month, and it's the <laughs> 11th hour, and uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Thanks for listening. For George Price and for the millions of others who died fighting in any war, 
uh, whether it made sense or didn't make sense, they were fighting. They were doing their job. They were fighting for their buddy next to them. And so hats off to them. And uh, the show is dedicated to all of them. And uh, also for Paul Schultz. I'm Steve Vinson, and nothing you and just nothing, heard, you just nothing, heard, you just nothing, heard, you what's just true, heard, what's just true, heard, what's just true, what's true, what's true. Because we're here, because we're here, we're here, because we're here, because we're here, because we're here. We see far better off, far better off. Far better off in a hug. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. Hello, 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 hello. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. Hello, 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 hello.